Hello and welcome back. Lately, I've been diving deep into the world of generative AI, exploring large language models beyond the image domain. It all started when I skimmed the paper, The Dawn of LMMs, or Large Multimodal Models on Archive. Some of the images presented in the manuscript were these, and it opened up a brand new avenue of thought for myself. These images, along with some autogen videos popping up in my YouTube feed, jump-started my curiosity. What if I could autonomously create a stable diffusion model by having AI agents fetch images that would then be captioned with chat and vision large language models? In addition, there have always been people in the YouTube comments on my posted videos asking about realistic models. Since I'm not exactly enthusiastic about creating realistic models, automating the process with machine learning would be akin to killing three stones with one bird. So I set out on this adventure, discovering that the real friends we make along the way are the insights into the practicality, application, and integration of local large language models. I aimed for a budget-friendly approach, using local models wherever possible. However, if you're open to investing, there are some more advanced options like OpenAI, API, and Replicate. If you don't want to use Autogen and spend money on the OpenAI API, you don't have to. It does get pretty expensive, but I wanted to show the template code as a proof of concept. You can curate your own dataset manually or fetch images using your own preset query list and the provided code. If you're curious and want to follow along, check out this repository on my GitHub. Let's get started. Before we go any further, I want to show this technical design flowchart here that I created in Excaladraw. As I mentioned before, there are three main parts to the project, and the first two are shown here, Autogen, and converting the upscaled images into the final dataset. The last step is just fine-tuning a model or training a LoRa in SDXL. This first section here will focus on the Autogen AI agents and fetching high-resolution images from Pinterest. The entire process is done under the purview of our AI agents, the prompt engineer and the technical engineer, with initial input from the user, aka us, the user proxy agent. We will give an initial message slash task input to the group chat consisting of the prompt engineer and the technical engineer. From our initial message, the prompt engineer will come up with a set number of queries that satisfies the types of images that we're interested in. Depending on how much input we give the prompt engineer, it will keep refining the search queries until we give our final approval. Once that's done, the prompt engineer will send the list of queries one by one to the technical engineer. This agent is in charge of running the fetch images script, which I may or may not have wrote and it uses a single query, so it goes one by one. To get the fetch images script to work properly, we'll have to install a few dependencies beforehand. In order to perform the image fetching, the script requires Selenium WebDriver and Beautiful Soup to get the page source.html file. This is an important step as the page source is where the image URL links are found. I'll be working in Windows Subsystem for Linux 2 with an Ubuntu 20.04 distro if you want to emulate my environment. I have an Ubuntu 22.04 version here just to show the installation process. I don't want to mess up my Ubuntu 20.04 environment, so this is why I'm on a different distro. In order to get the provided scripts to work, you'll need to install the Linux Google Chrome Web Driver or Chrome Driver. I followed this guide to install the Chrome Driver in Windows Subsystem for Linux 2, so we can just follow these commands. First off is the sudo apt get update and not much to be done here, pretty standard. And then the next command is this one, just copy paste, sudo apt get install, all that. Okay, that's done for now. That's just clear to get better visibility. Next up, we have to run a wget on the Google Chrome, but let's make a directory for it first. We'll just call it downloads. And let's just cd into that and then run the wget command here. So this one gets the current Google Chrome program, I guess. That's done. And then let's just go ahead and install it. That. And yes, we want to install. Oddly enough, there was an error. So it's saying that it doesn't have permissions to do this. Let's just go ahead and try a chmod on it. So like that. 
and then run it again. Like so, yeah, it says it's working now. Not sure what the issue was. And we can just go ahead and check the Google Chrome version, Google dash Chrome dash dash version. And yes, it's installed 118.0. Like this is important information. Next up, we have to find the correct Chrome driver version that matches what this output is here. Be sure to copy that. Head over to this website here. So this is the guide I was following. You can click on this to go to it, but eventually it'll lead you to this place. We'll just control F and then find this one, 118. This is the area we should be looking at. And remember, we want the Chrome driver, not the Chrome, Linux 64. So this would be the link that we want. Copy that and then head over back to the terminal. We can run the wget command now. However, if you looked at the website, you saw that there's an HTTP 404. Probably won't be able to download. HTTP request sent, error 404 not found. Congratulations, we've arrived at our first error. To remedy our issue of Chrome driver not being available currently, we'll have to go back and use this version instead, and we will download Chrome and Chrome driver from here. But first we have to uninstall the current Debian Google Chrome version that we just installed. Back here, to get rid of the current Google Chrome version, we type in sudo apt-get purge and then Google Chrome stable. Yes, it auto-completes for us. Run that. Yes. And for good measure, let's go ahead and remove the configuration file. It's here, like that. Okay, and let's go ahead and download Chrome again. So come back here and we want Linux 64. Let that run. Okay, unzip it. And yes, you can see that we have a Chrome here. If you enter that, it'll bring up a Chrome window. So yes, it's working. Let's go ahead and exit out of that. Now we also need Chrome driver. So let's go back to the website and get the corresponding Chrome driver for Linux 64. Here we are. So let's go up one and there you go. Once again, we'll have to unzip the driver that we downloaded. So unzip Chrome driver like so. And then we should have a directory with it. Now we go ahead and just copy and paste the commands. I think that this is the one, but we want to move the Chrome driver Linux 64 like that to that. So that looks good. And then we'll run the next command, this one, and then the last command, which is this one. And I think we should be good to go. I also navigated over to the user directory, bin, and then Chrome driver, and yes, our Chrome driver is here. We can also check the version of the Chrome program from the unzipped folder called Chrome Linux 64, and then we also have a Chrome inside, dash dash version, and it should be this. We already have the Chrome driver Linux installed for this, so everything should work properly. There's just one thing left to do, which is putting this version of Chrome Linux 64 in our path. To add our Chrome executable to our path, we're going to have to modify the bash RC file. So vim, like that. You can just go all the way to the end. So shift G if you're using vim, O to go down here, and then just paste this in. So, here we go, and save. Once we finish adding our path to the bash RC, remember we have to run source on it to refresh it, like so. And then let's leave this directory because remember Chrome executable is already in there. We want it to be available everywhere. Let's go ahead, there we go. Chrome is now available system-wide, which is great. 
Before we get into Autogen and AI Agents and the Fetch Images Pinterest script, I want to present a test script that showcases how the Selenium web driver actually works. Let's first off make a directory, a test Selenium, and then go into it, create a virtual environment. But before that, I'm going to set the Python version for this directory. I'm using pyenv like that, and I think I have that one, so I can go in here. Python dot version like that. Now let's go ahead and create a virtual environment. All we need is a Selenium package right now to be installed, but for good practice, let's just go ahead and make a requirements.txt that. And then we have everything we need right now. So pip install. Okay, that's done. And now let's just go ahead and create a Python file, vim test selenium, like that. I've already written a script that will showcase very rudimentary features, like so. The expected behavior of this script is that it will open up a web driver, navigate to google.com, and after 10 seconds, it will shut down and close the window and quit. There we have it. Let's go ahead and test it. I switched over to display capture so you can better understand the behavior. I'll enter my command and then it should bring up a window. So you see on the left here, it's opened up a web driver right here and it should quit out subsequently without me having to do anything. There you go. That is the behavior of Selenium web driver. If we go back and take a look at the code here, I've added in this option here where it says you can use headless. This basically means that it won't open up a window every time. You can choose to use this, but I usually choose not to enable this because I like to see or have visual confirmation that my web driver is actually navigating to that site and opening up. Now that you have the web driver set up and understand the basic functionality of it, we can head into the bulk of the first part, which is the Autogen and AI Agents section. Forgive the messiness of the current module's layout. I'm actually recording this as I'm going, as opposed to recording everything after I'm done like I usually do. The entry point to the first part is in this file, tentatively named app fetch image. I've created an environment file in the root.env, that stores all the variables such as folder names and API endpoints. If you're not familiar with how Autogen works, don't worry. It's very easy to understand once it's used practically. Other than the environment variable setup, you'll need to create an OpenAI config list JSON like this. This specifies the model you want to use in addition to your open API key. I'm going to use the best model, which is GPT-4. You can try using GPT-3.5 if you want to save money, but the results are often quite disappointing. Unfortunately, OpenAI is a paid service separate from ChatGPT, but it's not a subscription. You basically pay as much credits as you need, and if you don't have enough, you'll have to top off on more. You do need to use OpenAPI for this part if you want to use function calls. The current local language models don't have function calls supported. So this part right here. So we have no choice but to use OpenAPI's backend. I've already explained what the AI agents do in the introduction of this video. But for a quick refresher, we, the user proxy agent here, also named admin, sends an initial message or task to the group chat down here. You can see task is, I want you to create a data set of images from the website Pinterest. And I start the chat here. The chat members are this prompt engineer and the technical engineer. Just for context, I've given everyone names, like so, very imaginative, just underscore, separating them. The group chat consists of all of us. So if we look here, group chat, we have user proxy, which is me and the two engineers, technical engineer and prompt engineer. I've also given them both rudimentary roles through system messages. For the prompt engineer, I'm telling it to generate a list of search queries according to my specifications like so. For now, I'll keep it simple with female and male queries. Importantly, I'm also telling the prompt engineer that it cannot proceed unless I give a final approval. The prompt engineer has the bare bones configuration here. 
for the technical engineer, I am giving it the same or similar system message, but I'm also giving it a function map with a fetch image function. The fetch image function is imported from the Pinterest utils file here. And this is a nice segue into what the fetch image function roughly does. All this file really entails is just a more elaborate iteration of the test selenium python file I showed earlier. Instead of navigating to google.com, it's actually heading to the Pinterest search URL with the query appended to it. So this right here. There are just a few things I want to cover here in this fetch image function. Let's go in order. The fetch image function takes in a variable, which is the query then navigates to the corresponding URL. There are two variables here above it called the scroll num and the sleep timer. Scroll num is how many times you want to scroll a page downwards on each query page. The default is one, so the driver will only pick up the first page. Please adjust this accordingly depending on how many images you want. The second variable of interest is the sleep timer. I set this to 3 seconds, and it's the amount of time the driver will wait for the page to load its source HTML. With that being said, let's head over to the Pinterest site to understand what exactly the page source HTML consists of. Here we are on a sample query page. One of my hobbies is architectural design, and one of the techniques used in it is called massing. It's basically arranging 3D volumes in the initial design process. To access the page source, just go ahead and right click anywhere. If you're not logged into Pinterest, you won't be able to right click and inspect. However, when running the Pinterest utils Python script, you won't need to be logged in. What we're really looking for in the inspector over here in the elements is the image. And most importantly, we want the highest resolution image. To find it, it has the word originals inside of it. So let's just type that. And you can see when we hover over this right here, it selects the first architectural massing over here. It's highlighting this originals right here. This is the four times image, which would be the highest resolution. So we can access it, we'll just copy it. And you can see this is the highest resolution we can get. And all we have to do is just send a request here to download it. It's basically the same as clicking on this and let's just close out this window, clicking here and then clicking download image. Nothing special. There is one gotcha here that might not be so apparent. You might think, great, this is pretty simple or sounds pretty simple. All we have to do is just get the page source HTML and then search for all the image tags that have originals. However, I have a copy of the page source HTML here right now, downloaded through using Beautiful Soup. So let me just go ahead and search originals. And you can see down here, pattern not found. There is no originals. But if I just search the simple image, so I think it's just I dot pin image, like so, it matches 47 cases. You can look here. The first case that you have this image string right here that leads to a JPEG. However, you can see there's this 236x, probably not the highest resolution. What do we do? I believe the issue is that you have to be logged in to see the full page source that includes the originals. Without logging in, we can only see the normal preview thumbnail image resolutions, which are in this format. Now we can choose to do one of two things. The first one is to log in to Pinterest and then fetch the images, hopefully seeing whether or not we can fetch the originals, or we can go with the second option, which is a more foolproof method. Once again, here I am in the Pinterest utils file. The way that I handled the original's image resolution not being available in the non-logged in page source HTML is actually quite simple. If we go down here, you can see that I use a transform link to original right here. And in this function, all I do is I just replace the slash 236x with slash originals. Pretty ingenious, right? As long as you perform this operation, you can actually request the highest resolution image. It's a very hacky way of doing it. After I run the request, I have a few lines of code handling edge cases. The first one is 
if either the image is giving a status code of 200, which means it's not available, or image is not in the headers, then I just don't get that image. Second of all, I want to make sure that the image is accessible and that the width and the height is above 512 pixels. I don't want to fetch any images that are too low quality or just a crop of something. And that's it. That's all you have to do. Now let's go ahead and actually try out this script. You can notice that I have the Pinterest utils here, but I also have a separate single call here just for testing it out. And I've already added a preset query here, which is beautiful female K-pop idols. Here I am in my autogen directory, and I'll just go ahead and run Pinterest utils single like so. And you can see what it does here. Start that up. You can see it opens up a window here, the driver, it does its thing and it should close on its own after it's picked up the images. Because of the checks that were added into the script, you can see that these images had invalid responses, meaning they had a status code of 200. Now, where are these images? We just have to go to here, temp, and then you can see the folder name is beautiful K-pop, female K-pop idols here. And then we have all the images right here. That we're on page one. That's more or less what the script does. I'm back in the autogen main file now, which is app fetch image. And I've revised some of the tasks here for the main task and the prompt engineer system message. So the task has now changed to pick from Asian and Caucasian females and males. And I told it to focus on idols, actors, and models. I also want realistic architecture designs and realistic weapon design. In the prompt engineer, I changed the system message to get me 10 queries. Eight queries will be human beings, five of them female, three of them male, and the remaining two will be the realistic architecture designs or realistic weapon designs. One more change that I want to make is in Pinterest utils. Instead of a scroll num of one, I want a scroll num of three so I can get more images. Everything looks good to go, so let's go ahead and run the code. We're ready to run the autogen script now, so let's go ahead, Python app fetch images 02 pi and do that. It's working on generating queries right now, and we will give our input to refine them once that's done. Okay, so it's given us one, two, three, four, five, ten. And we can change any of these if we want. The first one I want to change is option number two, which is pretty Asian female celebrities. That's already pretty similar to one, so please change option two to most beautiful Korean fashion models. Okay, so that's changed already, you can see here. Next up, I want to change the first option so that it becomes K-pop idols instead. So please change option one. There we go. Option one and option two are changed. We can make more changes if we want. Okay, so these are our final queries. Five of them up here and then three here. It was originally supposed to be five females, three males, and two miscellaneous, but of course, We've refined it using our user proxy agent admin privileges. Now, I think this looks good, so I'm just going to give it a LGTM, which is encoding. It means looks good to me. It should start and go ahead, pass all of these to the technical engineer. So there you go. And it's opened up the web driver here, like so. Doing its scroll. Okay, so it's done and it gave us the invalids, so I didn't download those. Next one, most beautiful Korean fashion models. And when it's done, it should close on its own. I'm not doing anything here right now. Next up, most beautiful Chinese fashion models. Olzing now, this should give us face models, and it does. Get all these people. The API calls have all finished running, and you can see here that I have all of these fetched images. 
Yes. Sure. And what? Let's just check. Architecture. Yeah, that looks good too. Now that you have a collection of images as the base of your data set, you can start pruning it if you want or just head straight to the upscale process. If you have a large volume of images, you probably won't prune it too much or just go as is. To upscale, it's very simple. Go ahead and go to the upscale directory and just copy over the low resolution images or just the originals downloaded from Pinterest. You can just go in here and delete all the images because this is going to be where the output high resolution upscaled images will be. And we just need the corresponding folder name. Here I'll be using the paid software Topaz Gigapixel AI since I think it's the best upscaler. But you're free to choose something like GFP GAN or Real ESR GAN if you want. I haven't renewed my Topaz Gigapixel subscription in about a year or two, so you might get better results than I do if you have a up-to-date subscription. Just going to copy over the images like that. So you can see all the images are loaded in and it's trying to work on a preview for us. Okay, so it's updated and you can see it's like that. Not bad, not bad. You can also see that I set it to a custom upscale, which is three times the original size. You can go higher at four, but sometimes I find that this starts to make up some more details and I don't really want that to happen. Yeah, this seems good enough for my use case. Now just go ahead and save those 29 images in the upscale directory that I showed earlier. Save and it'll go ahead and do its batch processing. Very simple. Continue to do this for as many directories of images that you have and then we should be good to go. You should have prepared a clean upscale data set by now, whether if you use Autogen and AI agents or manually by hand, or using the Pinterest script or some other method. If you've ever trained a stable diffusion model with a data set, then you'll know that you need corresponding captions for the images that you've gathered. To perform autonomous data set tagging, I'm going to employ chat and vision large language models. So, in this section, I'm going to present a gamut of ways you can host your own large language chat and vision models locally, as well as going over one paid option. I'll be alternating between them in orders of ease of use and incremental quality. But ultimately, my final pipeline uses the llama.cpp repository implementation for the chat and vision model. The local models that I'll be trying out are the quantized 4-bit models of Lava 1.5 with one from the bloke and the other one from MIS or MYS. Before we go ahead and acquire the models, we need a framework that can actually load these models. The first one I'll go over is the ubiquitous text generation web UI. Installing the text generation web UI is simple and complex at the same time. I ended up installing the Windows version because there are plenty of unseen bugs occurring on the web UI on other operating systems. To install it, just follow these commands. Clone or download the repository and then run start windows bat if you're using windows. This is where my text generation web UI is installed. So if you go ahead and do that, you can see that I have this windows.batch file here. However, as I mentioned before, the text generation web UI is prone to many complex bugs. As such, I thought it would be prudent to mention what commit hash I'm on. So let's go ahead and run this command, git rev dash parse and then head. If you don't want to roll the dice on the most up-to-date recent commit hash, you can check out the commit hash that I'm showing right here because this is guaranteed to be working, at least for me. To get on the same hash that's here, just copy it like that and type in git checkout like that. So you can see that this is the output. If you want to create a branch just for this commit hash, you can follow what it says here. git switch dash c, I'll just call this working branch. Nothing fancy. And if I want to return to where I was before in the detached head state, we can just go back and check out main. So git check out main like that. And let's just go ahead and check the hash to make sure we're on the working hash. So yeah, now we have main and working branch are on the same hash. 
but on main we can get pull if we want but I'm not going to do that because I'm scared of it breaking something. So there we go. We have the text generation web UI installed, but we also need some large language models as well to load in. For this part, I'm going to use the recommended model, which is the quantized 13 billion parameter version from the bloke. Here she has been so kind as to provide us the download commands down here. Before downloading this model, you might ask, how do I know which model to use? Which models are supported? Where is the documentation? How do I start up my server? I also had the same questions, so I followed the GitHub pull requests and some of the commit history. I ended up finding these two links that were very helpful. So the first one is this pull request, support lava 1.5 by Hao Tian Liu. I'm not sure what his Chinese characters are. And he is the original creator of Lava 1.5. And this is the commit log. More on this later. If you search his name, it'll lead you to the repository on Hugging Face. So this is the original. You can see these large binary files here. So the first two are 10 gigabytes, more or less a piece. And the last one is six gigabytes. These binary files are called shards. And roughly speaking, shards allow machines with limited VRAM to run large or very large models through parallelism. However, I'm not so sure that this can actually be loaded in on a consumer 24 gigabyte VRAM card like a 4090. With that being said, let's head back to the GitHub pull request. In this section, he says, first download the checkpoints from the bloke to models. And there's two versions. Uh, Lava version 1.5, 13 billion parameters, GPTQ, and the other one is GPTQ 4bit32G. I think this is the one that I ended up using. But if you click on this, it takes you over to the very first link for the Hugging Face repo I showed you. We'll just go with this one for now. However, if we go to the very end of this pull request, the most recent comment here, by random internet pressin says that you can actually load in the original sharded model. So this one that I just showed you, the 10 gigabyte, maybe 26 gigabyte version. This can be loaded in if you use 4-bit and following Uba Buga's example. Uba Buga is the maintainer of this repository. I actually haven't been able to try this myself but if you go to the readme here on the main page and search 4-bit right here, there's an accelerate 4-bit. And I assume this is the flag that you add to make it work. So dash dash load in 4-bit. Just some extra information for all those people that are curious. Let's go ahead and download the model now. I'm on my external hard drive called the H drive. And I'm going to go ahead and make a sample directory. So make dir test underscore LLM like that, and then CD into that like so. We're going to have to run a command called pip install hugging face dash hub. And if you haven't installed this, I suggest making a virtual environment first. So something like this, go ahead and activate your virtual environment with this PMV scripts, and then activate. And then you can see in green, it's activated. We'll go back and install Hugging Face. So that one, I don't think we need pip3 here. Let that go. And now let's go ahead and just follow the commands. So make dir, that one, and then copy the second command, this one. So we'll be getting GPTQ 4bit32G act order, this one. We'll just let that run until it's finished. Just for comparison, if you want to see what the quantized version looks like, we can just head over to files and versions, and you can see that there is a 7.26 gigabyte file in here, model.save tensors, as opposed to the sharded version, which is around 26, 27 gigabytes. This is much smaller and able to run on a single consumer GPU. 
Once the model is downloaded, just copy it over here inside the models folder inside the text generation web UI directory. I've already done so, so you can see all the different models I have in here. To start up the API server with the model loaded, you'll need to consult the docs, which is this page right here. And it gives you plenty of commands here that you can follow. We will be following this one. But before we do that, we can go over here and look at the commit log. So you can see that the changes were made pretty recently, two weeks ago, to support the multimodal for Lava 1.5 right here. Once you're on this multimodal page for the readme, you can get a better understanding of the necessary commands. Before running your command, you'll have to first activate your Python environment. When you first ran the startup script, so one of these three, Linux, Mac OS, or Windows, a conda environment was created for you. So you can activate that environment by pointing towards the env folder. But where is the env folder? Don't worry, we can find it very easily. Go to installer files here, and then you can see env right here. So just go ahead and cd into that as well. pwd to get the path to it. Copy that. Go back up two levels to the root of the text generation web UI and simply type in conda activate whatever you copied here. And you can see right here in parentheses, our environment has been activated. Now that your conda environment is activated, you can start up the server. Here is the command that I used. In the documentation, it didn't seem like the absolute path to the model was necessary. However, if I didn't do this, it actually aired out on me, so I'm not sure about the behavior. Other than that, everything else is just straight from the documentation. I did add in this dash dash listen because I wanted this to be available on all networks. So go ahead and enter. If all goes well, you should have this kind of output here. Your local server will be on 7860 and will go there soon after this part, but I also want to draw attention to these two right here. Starting API at here, localhost 5000 slash API, and also streaming server is at API v1 slash stream. I don't think we'll be using this, but it's good to know that it's available here if you would like to use a streaming server. Before I start demoing the GUI server and the API server, I just wanted to mention that this is a smaller subset of images that I'll be working with. They've already been upscaled, so let's go. When you navigate over to localhost 7860, this is what you're greeted with. It's all very complicated and simple at the same time. You have your parameters and your model. Since we loaded the model in using the command line, we already have our model loaded in. We don't have to choose. However, before we start using this, I do want to head over back to the pull request over here. Down here, he mentions something interesting. Can we have a lower temperature like 0.2? Is there a way to set it as the default for a specific model? The maintainer Uba Buga mentioned that it's probably better to use Divine Intellect preset and it works better than the default one. So why don't we try to integrate both of these together? So let's head over to Text Generation Web UI. Go to Parameters. Right now you can see the preset is on Simple 1. The suggestion was to use Divine Intellect. So let's pick this one. And you can see the temperature right now is at 1.31. We can change this to 0.2 like so. And then we can save a new preset. Save and then we can call it whatever we want. I'll call it divine intellect 04, like so. And then we can refresh, go here, and here is our divine intellect 04. And when we select it, it's at 0 0.2. I've made all these other divine intellect other ones as well, so they're all at varying temperatures because I was experimenting. So let's just go with 04, 0 0.2 for now. Finally, let's head over to chat. And usually the default will be on chat. We can change it to chat instruct or instruct. Uh, the results are kind of variable here, but chat instruct does do pretty well. Now let's start using it. So we'll copy over one image, drag mine over here, and I'll just say, please describe this image with as much detail as possible and generate. It sends the image over 
And here you go. In the image, there is a young woman wearing a white shirt standing in front of a white background. She appears to be posing confidently while looking at something off camera, etc, etc. Yes, you can see that this is working. However, it's not perfect. It didn't describe the hair color and it also didn't describe the eye color. These are things that would be pretty dangerous not to do when tagging a data set. You can see that this is not perfect yet. Let's go ahead and try another image. So here we go. Shin Hati from Ahsoka. And we'll give it the same prompt again. And now you can see it gives us this very short and concise description. This is a person who is dressed in all black clothing and not exactly what we want. Maybe it's just an error. Maybe it's a one-off. Let's try and go with a third image. How about a background like so? Once again, this is the description for a background or environment image now. It's pretty detailed and I think this is pretty well described. It could always be better, but it is what it is. Now that you have a general idea of what the lava model can do, I want to go back and try out the previous images again with a different prompt. So let's go here again, bring in our Chloe image. And this time I'm going to use a different task because if you recall, when we tag our data set, we can't use complete sentences or we shouldn't use complete sentences. We should use short descriptions or tags that are separated by commas. And this is the command that I'm using. So let's go ahead and generate. After sending in my prompt, it says white shirt on woman. It seems that when we detail our prompt so much or our task, the model runs into some kind of hallucination trouble. Let's see if it's consistent. Another image, same task. This is the new task with a different image. It didn't hallucinate this time and gave us a pretty okay description. It says that it's using black lipstick, but it's actually dark maroon lipstick, I guess. And then it says her lips are red in color. So very interesting. Black attire, fur coat, shirt. I mean, it could seem like that. However, I want it to not be in complete sentences. I wanted it to be separated by commas. It's not doing that. So let's refine our prompt even more. Same image and a more refined task. This time I say, please describe this image in an objective manner using only comma separated phrases, no complete sentences and all the things that I wanted to pick up. So let's go. You can see it's trying to put it into comma separated description that is more reminiscent of our stable diffusion training data set. However, it still can't do it. So what else can we do? Well, remember the parameters. We can change the temperature. Temperature at 0.2 is the suggested, and the higher you go, the more subjective the results become. So why don't we go a little lower? So I already have a preset for that one. For Divine Intellect 02, and that one's at 0.1, and I think I have 03, which is at 0.05, which is the most objective or nearly as objective as it can be. So let's go ahead and make sure we're using that one. It should be loaded in. We'll come back and do it once more. So let's just start a new chat for good measure and go. And yes, changing our temperature could not rescue this no matter what we did. So what do we do now? Well, maybe this is just a consequence of using the GUI server. Maybe if we use the API server, we can get a different result. So let's go ahead and try it out. Before we use the API server, we'll have to make a few changes to our code. The first change is to the text generation web UI API endpoint in the environment variables. Here I've called it local underscore vision API. Remember, our Linux workspace for this project is in the Windows subsystem for Linux, and the network for that is different from the text generation web UI running on Windows network. That's why I have this IP address over here as opposed to localhost. To make sure that we can actually make the API request from inside our virtualized Linux container to the Windows network, we'll have to run this command to get the IP address. So there we go. The name server is 192.168. 
And if we go back to the environment variables, you can see that I've already integrated that in here. If we want to check out how I got slash API slash V1, all we have to do is just head over to where our server is running in the text generation web UI. So remember when it started up, I said, this is where it's starting from slash API. To understand what the final endpoint is, you can just go back to the documentation for multimodal usage through API. And it says down here, API slash V1 slash generate. And if you need even more confirmation, head over to the API examples here. And you can also see it's API slash V1 slash generate. If you take a look at this example file that I'm about to use, I've made the appropriate changes here by appending slash generate to the end of the local vision API right here to match what was in the documentation. While we're at it, we can also take a look at this API example.py file and see that when we send our request, we can send more than the prompt. We can also change other parameters such as the temperature or the preset. If you go back and look at the code that I have here, you can see that I have added some extra things such as stopping strings and the preset as well. And the preset is going to be divine intellect 03 that I created earlier. I think I created divine intellect 04. You can use whatever you want, but in that there is a temperature change that I made. So there we go. Let's go ahead and run the sample code that I provided. This will make an API call from the working directory to the Windows text generation web UI. So here we go. And I've already set an image that I want to work on, which is the Shin Hati image. And this is the description that we get. Long white hair, brown coat, unusual appearance, necklace, and indoors. Let's go back to the web UI and check again. Here I am in the web UI, and I have my Divine Intellect 03 loaded up in here. If you want to do the exact one-to-one -one comparison with API server and the web UI, you should be using this instruction template. However, it doesn't really matter too much. So let's just go back, go to the chat, and try again. Okay, so let's go ahead and generate. Here we go. You can see that since we're not using the instruction template, it's giving us something more concise and akin to this kind of description. Ultimately though, what we're concerned with is the response from the API server because we can get more complete information. Using the GUI is fine and all, but that's just for a test purpose. So once again, I'm going to run this code, but I've changed the index of the image that I want to use. Here we go. And this time it's picking Chloe 01. I'll show that one after this output comes back. So the output has returned to us and surprisingly, we asked it in English and it applied to us in Mandarin Chinese. If you understand uh, Chinese, this is actually pretty accurate. So it means in this photo, there is a woman relaxing. And I'll go ahead to the GUI and show you guys that image. Let me bring in the Chloe 01 image, if you're curious. Looks like this. I'm, I'm not sure if her name is actually Chloe or not. I saw on Pinterest that she's a German model in Korea. Woman wearing red bikini top sitting in wicker chair. So I'm not sure what exactly is going on but I am getting a Chinese input from the prompt I'm using. So for now, the Lava 1.5 13 billion quantized model is okay, but what if there's something better out there? Let's go ahead and explore that avenue. Let's go ahead and take a short break or interlude by exploring a paid option called Replicate. Replicate is a machine learning backend that hosts several models and simplifies the setup and machine learning engineering into an API. I'll be trying out the same Lava 1.5 13 billion parameter model here provided by York VP, but this time I think the model hosted here is the full sharded version and not the quantized version that I've been using locally. For the first part, I'll be using the GUI demo, so click on that. In addition, I'd also like to mention issues I had with instruction or task command. You've probably already noticed that depending on the verbosity of the task, the outputs are either very detailed or extremely concise. The naive approach, or glob version as I like to call it, 
is to be as vague as possible. I've already shown it with this task of please describe this image in as much detail as possible. Let me bring in the image that I want to use. So this one. And let's go ahead and maybe, yeah, 1024 token seems fine and run it. And here is the reply. So you can see that red top, red bow, sitting on chair, posing for camera, center of scene, upper body facing the viewer, in the background, potted plant, yes, on the left, and the chair occupies a significant portion of the image, yes. So you can see that this is already performing very, very well. However, that's because I use this very short prompt. Even though it's performing better, there's a lot of things that's not being described such as the length of the hair, the color of the eyes, the age of the woman, her tattoo here, the color of the wall. So you can see it's not perfect, but it is a step up from blip. That being said, what if I want to change my prompt up? What if I want to use the second prompt that I've had, the very verbose one, telling it to give me captions, which are separated by commas? How will this perform? So you can see using the more descriptive prompt, it turns out to give me this, a woman with red hair, clearly not red hair, blue eyes, not really blue eyes, more gray, red top and red and white skirt. I think these are maybe pants. I don't know. It could be either or. The chair is woven and the woman is leaning on it. The background is blurry. Uh, I don't know about that. When I make the prompt very detailed, I tend to get very poor output results. Now that you've seen what's possible with the demo, I also want to show the code that you can use if you want to call the replicate backend as opposed to using this GUI. They provided the API in this second tab, and it's very, very simple actually to set up. First, let's get the replicate API token. So click on that, sign in, and here are my tokens. All you have to do is just copy. Once you have copied the replicate token, just paste it in your ENV right here as the replicate variable. Once you've imported your variable or loaded your variable here, you can just set your replicate API token environment to whatever was imported from over here. Done. Now let's go back to the API tab. This is a JavaScript or Node.js version. If you want other versions, here's a Python one. So go over here and you can see how they set up the API call. Just send it like that. Your input will be the path to file. And for item and input, it returns an iterator. And I assume that the output has words appended onto it. It'll make sense once you see it, I guess. All I've done is just copied exactly what was there before. Here's my task. Prompt task image is the image path locally and I also adjusted the temperature. Maybe I'll make 0.2 to be consistent. That. Let's go ahead and run the script now that has the replicate version in it. This one and go. And we get this reply. The image features a beautiful young woman wearing a red top and a matching red skirt. Worker chair. Yes, red headband. Potted plant. Touch greenery. Yes. So this is very good. You can see that I'm using the task here that is very concise. Let's go ahead and change it. Hopefully we won't get anything that is remotely resembling Mandarin this time, but you never know. And you can see that we have a more verbose prompt. The corresponding output description is much more concise. There's no potted plant or touch of greenery here anymore. So I feel like we can conclude that we probably need two stages. First, we need a prompt that collectively tries to describe everything in the initial image and then distill it down into something we can consider worthy or fitting for a stable diffusion caption dataset. After that short interlude with Replicate, let's head back into the world of local large language models. As I mentioned before, I wasn't satisfied with the image descriptions output by the GPTQ quantized version of the Lava 1.5 13 billion parameter model. So I wanted to try another smaller version in the form of Lava 1.5 
7 billion parameters. The model that we'll need is the quantized GGUF model provided by MIS or MYS. Head over to your terminal and hopefully you're using the same directory where you downloaded the Lava 13B GPTQ version. I'm going to be using the same directory, but you'll have to activate your virtual environment because you want to use the Hugging Face CLI. So there we go. Next, go ahead and create a directory. So I'm going to just use the original name, done. And all I have to do is run the Hugging Face CLI command now. So here we go. And just wait for this to finish downloading if you want, or you can download them individually. Once you're done downloading the model, you'll also need to clone the Llama CPP repository. You can think of this as something akin to the text generation web UI as they both fulfill the same function of loading the large language models. The reason why we're using Llama CPP is because the .ggUF file format for Lava 1.5 is not currently supported on the text generation web UI loader as of this video recording. In addition, since this video is written in C, Make sure you're using a Nix system like Mac OS or Linux. If you're using Windows, you'll need to figure that out on your own, either using MinGW or WSL from the terminal. I'm just going to clone it into my Windows subsystem for Linux Ubuntu distro. So go here and just copy that. Git clone, and there we go. Once you've cloned it, CD into it, so llama.cpp. Also, once you're in here, you'll have to run the make command. Just type make because you want to create binary executables like the server file. So make. Okay, so it's done. I'm gonna clear it and just show it here. You can see we have a server now right here in green. And that is what we'll be using. In addition, you can also see that Lava was built here. So if you don't want to use a server or GUI, you can run this executable on its own. However, we won't be doing that. Before we start running the server, I want to show where you should put your models. Remember, we downloaded the models using the Hugging Face CLI. I've put my models in this folder under models and under lava directory. I've put in everything in there except the very large like 16 gigabyte file. So the one that we'll be using is the quantized 4 bit here. However, this model takes significantly longer and the improvement is very minimal. You're welcome to try this on your own, but I will not be using it in this demonstration. Also, you'll need to have this MM project model file in here as well. I'm back in my Ubuntu distro now and I want to go into Llama CPP. Before we start, I also want to show what commit hash I'm on because I'm not sure how stable Llama CPP is, but if you'd like to follow along and be on a branch that's actually working, this is what I'm on, E393259. It's probably two weeks old or so, so there have probably been plenty of improvements, but for the sake of continuity and having things work, I will be sticking with this hash. Now to start up the server, we'll just use this command here slash server to run the binary executable that I showed earlier, and then a dash m to specify the model, the gguf file. This is the host, this is the port, and lastly, this file here, and enter. It'll say that our server is now available here at 8081. Let's go ahead and access it. If you navigate over to localhost at port 8081, you'll be greeted with this very bare bones GUI setup here. If this shows up, great, you did it. So now let's go ahead and upload an image along with a message. Send. So this is the response. The image features a young woman with blonde hair posing for the camera. She has her hand on her neck and is looking at something in front of her. Her outfit consists of a white shirt or top that accentuates her appearance. In addition to this, she appears to be wearing an undershirt underneath her clothing. May or may not be true, I don't know. The overall scene exudes confidence as the woman looks directly into the camera lens. I don't know about you, but this sounds pretty accurate to me. The only thing that's really missing is the eye color and mentioning that the image is cropped. So I already feel like this is outperforming pretty well. 
However, let's try another image. This is the second response for this second image. Image features a young woman with long hair, black and white clothing, yes. Posing for the camera while looking at it intently, yes. Makeup includes red lipstick on her lips, yes. Uh, shot inside an indoor environment, possibly a studio or room with a clean background, yes. And she might be in a photo shoot or enjoying the moment, subjective, but more or less, yes. I'm already quite impressed with what this Lava 1.5 7 billion parameter version is doing. Now let's go ahead and before we jump into the API and evaluate the performance of the more verbose instruction or prompt. This is the same prompt that I've been using on the text generation web UI to try to get the output to be in the form of the stable diffusion tagging data set format. However, I'm not sure how this will fare, so let's try it out. So you can see that when I stack the prompt with more description or details, the resulting output is more concise and oftentimes wrong. It's saying that she has her eyes closed, looking upward as she poses for the camera. The background appears to be blurry or grainy in this image. I don't think any of this is true right here. There, the proof is in the pudding. A more concise instruction probably leads to better results. This is some test code that I've written, which makes an API call to the Llama CVP server. In the environment variables file, I've set the API endpoint to be localhost 8081 slash completion. Where does this slash completion come from? Well, I'll go over that soon. Inside the test file on the left, you can see what the API call looks like. Here in this line 67 that I'm sending a post request to the local Lava CPP API environment variable over here that I just mentioned with a payload consisting of these variables. You might ask, where am I getting this information from as well? Great question. Let's head over to the examples directory inside Llama CPP. This is the root of the Llama CPP repository that we've cloned locally. To see the server examples, go to examples, and then in here, server, and then there's a readme.md file. In this markdown file, you can see that there's a test JavaScript snippet here where it says slash completion. So I assume that is the endpoint, and yes, it is. However, furthermore, we have the arguments or variables down here. And the one I want to point out is the image one because this one is a little bit different from the text generation web UI. Here, when you send your image data, you can send your image data as a array of a dictionary, if that makes sense. Your data is going to be an image converted into a base64 string, and then it'll also be assigned an ID. I think the point of assigning an ID is to make sure that there is some kind of context regarding this image. So if this image has ID of one, when you refer to this image, you'll say in ID image one, please describe this image or something of the sort. Now that that's cleared up, let's head back to the test code. Back in the test code, you can see on line 49, my image is converted into a base 64 string. And then my image data is an array of an object with data and ID properties. So that's fine. And then that image data goes here to image data. I think if this is JavaScript, we could just make this simpler. I forget what it's called. So everything looks good to me. I have an image ID here that I increment every time I iterate through a new file. With that being said, my image ID is in here and then it's followed by my task. Even if I send multiple image and tasks in subsequent order, the task will know to process on that specific image ID. Okay, everything looks good to me. Let's go ahead and run it now. This is the file that has the test code. So let's go ahead and run that. Here we go. This is the corresponding output description. The image features a young woman with long hair wearing a black and white outfit posing for the camera, looking directly at it while smiling. Red lipstick on her lips, good. Out of focus or blurry, set against a white wall, great. 
So, in my opinion, the quantized 7 billion parameter version is outperforming the 13 billion parameter version. However, we still have to deal with the issue in which this output description is not in the format of what the stable diffusion tag dataset needs to be in. We need descriptions separated by commas, whereas this is a sentence or multiple sentences. What do we do? Don't worry, the text generation web UI setup was not in vain. We will use that environment to load up a chat model, namely Mistral 7B. Before we head back to text generation web UI, we need to get the Mistral 7B instruct version 0.1 GGUF file. Once again, our good friend the bloke has developed this model for us. And if we go to files and versions, there's a number of versions to choose from. The one that I've chosen to go with is this one, Mistral 7B instruct version 0.1, quantized 5-bit underscore K underscore M. So instead of using the Hugging Face CLI or Git cloning this repository, if you did that, you would end up cloning all of these files. You just want one of them. So you just click on the arrow here and download. When you download this file, you also have to download this config.json file. So I'll let you go ahead and do that on your own. If you'd like to know the difference between the various models provided, you can go down here, go to the section provided files, and then see all of the use cases here. You can see the one that I selected is quantized 5-bit KM, large, very low quality or loss, recommended. You can see other versions are recommended as well. If your GPU is limited on VRAM, you can probably go with this one, Q4KM. However, I'm going to stick with this version right here. Just for reference, this is what my text generation web UI models folder looks like. You can see I have a Mistral 7B instruct and inside I have my GGUF file and my config file. Let's go ahead and start up the server again using the text generation web UI, but for the chat instruct Mistral model this time. The command is slightly different from the multimodal command that we used for the Lava 1.5 13 billion parameters model earlier. Remember to activate your conda environment like so. And once you have that in, I'm going to put in the command to run the server. You can see that it's a little bit different this time. For the model, I'm pointing to the Mistral 7B instruct folder. For extensions, I'm using OpenAPI. Lastly, the loader is llama.cpp. You might recall when I was running the Lava 1.5 13B GPTQ version, I was also using extensions here, but after extensions, I had multimodal instead of OpenAPI. So let's start that up. Once the server is up and running, you can see that the OpenAI compatible API is available at this link right here, port 5001 slash v1. Now, let's head over into VS Code and take a look at the sample code I wrote for calling the Mistral API. In the function get response text right here, I'm creating a chat completion class from the OpenAI module. This is different from the other sample test codes where we just straight up made a post request to an API endpoint. Let's go ahead and take a look at the OpenAPI documentation to get a better idea of what's going on. This is the markdown readme file in the OpenAI directory under extensions directory of text generation web UI. So for the very first thing, the quick start here tells you about the open API key and the open API base or API endpoint. The declaration of these environment variables is mandatory. If you don't do this, calling the create method on the chat completion class will fail. If you keep scrolling down all the way to API documentation and examples, they have a simple Python example that you can copy and paste or use as a reference. Second of all, while we're here, I also want to point out which API endpoint to use. Since we're using the instruct version of the Mistral model, it will be under the instruction endpoint. Use it with instruction following models. Your API endpoint will be v1 slash chat slash completions, and it's tested with the chat completion create right here. In the Python example, this is exactly what's happening. Lastly, below API endpoints, there are these parameters that you can change. The usual culprits such as streaming, temperature, top P, max token, stop should all work as expected. And there are some extra hacky mappings that you can use if you want right here.
Now that we know a little more about the documentation, it's time to distill down our verbose text description from Llama CPP into a description separated by commas. You could do this programmatically, but I found that asking a local large language model to do it was superior. As you can see here, I'm using string interpolation once again to format my instruction. I tried quite a few instructions as evidenced by all these commented outlines, but I really only found that this one was effective in formatting the verbose description into a stable diffusion ready dataset caption. Please rephrase this so that it is a description separated by only commas and no periods, and then the description. This description right here is from Llama CPP that I just copy and pasted over. Back in the terminal, let's go ahead and try out Mistral. Python call Mistral03. And here we go, this is the final result. A young woman with long hair wearing a black and white outfit poses for the camera while smiling. Her red lipstick adds to her overall appearance. The background of the photo appears blurred or out of focus, drawing attention to the woman as the main, yada yada yada. There is a gap here, but don't worry, I handle that later on. So let's head over to the final version of the code that combines everything together. This is the final script that I used, which is the iterate Python file. If you need a refresher, we're starting with the upscale directory, which has all of our high resolution images. We'll iterate over each folder in the upscale directory and process the images in each of the subdirectories. I've added in some rudimentary code here that will let you resume training if you do encounter an error. It outputs a progress text file that keeps track of which image you are processing. It's robust in a way since I sort the subdirectories and the subdirectory image files. If you do decide to restart processing from scratch, delete the progress.txt right here. Anyway, the code functions by sending the subdirectory upscaled images one by one to the Llama CPP server hosting the quantized chat and vision model of Lava 1.57 billion parameters. So remember in our upscale folder, we have many subdirectories. I have curated this so it's just one right now that we can all enjoy. The Llama CPP server returns a verbose description of the image we gave it from this function. Remember, describe image CPP. We then send this verbose description to the text generation web UI server that is hosting the Mistral model with the hopes that it will rephrase the description into captions separated by commas. So this is the function get response text. Not much new is happening in the rephrasing of the description except these two parts. The first is cleaning the text so that there aren't any strange punctuation errors or spaces like you saw previously. After that's completed, I prepend a trigger word at the very beginning like so with some more string interpolation to simulate the trigger word in fine tuning or LoRa models. So here you can see trigger word and if we go up to environment, variables, here I am importing a trigger word from my environment variables right here. The contents of my trigger word might be a little strange, but I did read somewhere that injecting numbers helped somewhat in the token formation process. So there we go. And I did get pretty good results with it. Now comes the slightly more convoluted portion. Remember, the upscaled images exist in their own original aspect ratios and corresponding resolutions. This is a no-go since it's not in the correct pixel resolution and aspect ratio for stable diffusion Excel training. I've written some code here to process that. The entry point is the best crop function right here and it's imported from the detect utils Python file up here. The logic for these functions was pretty challenging to come up with, so I'll just give you guys the rough summary of it. There are two cases that this code will handle. When I first had the inspiration of using large language models to annotate a stable diffusion data set, I was thinking only of training on human beings. However, I quickly came to the realization that I wanted a more varied selection of training images so I started adding in environment and prop images. In the first case, when a human face is detected here from detect face torch, it will create a bounding box around the face. Depending on how much the face takes up in the current upscaled image resolution, a certain amount of dynamic padding will be added. Here is the function for dynamic padding, and this was more or less a trial and error process for me. 
Depending on how much the face takes up in the current upscaled image resolution, a certain amount of dynamic padding will be applied. Then, new boundaries for width and height will be drawn according to the SDXL presets right here. At the bottom of best crop, you have the final dimensions here. As for the face detection, we can go over to the detect face torch function right here. This uses a faster R CNN model with the ResNet 50 backbone. It's a pretty classic model from back in the day, but it performs the task of face detection quite well still. If you're more advanced, you're free to use the new versions of YOLO or DeepFace. To ensure the code is user friendly enough, I focused on simplifying the setup process by using a pre-trained model included with PyTorch. So you can see here, face model and torch vision models. I'm importing this ResNet 50 backbone. From a user experience design standpoint, this is all already pretty confusing to set up, especially if you're not an engineer. So I tried to streamline it as easily as possible using existing pre-trained models that you can import directly from PyTorch. Now we come to the second case. In the event where a face is not detected, for example, environments, we move to the next line of defense, which is saliency maps. You can see here if no face is detected, if box is none, we go to the compute saliency map function up here. This is also a pretty old school machine learning method. Basically with deep learning, you can determine which areas of an image attract the highest visual attention. This is also quite complicated. So I'm not going to go in depth on this at all. Once the saliency map is calculated, it'll return a bounding box once again, and then the new boundaries based on dynamic padding will be drawn just like before. If you're more advanced, you can try out some zero-shot object detection methods instead. I'll leave that up to you to experiment. There's just one more thing that I want to point out here. When you run this code, you might get an error saying that this hook function here and compute saliency map function is not permitted. For now, it's working. I did try to debug it to no avail, unfortunately. I believe the error comes from me working on Torch 2.0 or 2.x version as opposed to Torch 1.x. And my tricks there worked, but I think I'm being punished for that now here. So it's working, but I don't know how to fix the error. I have my servers open on the right side. Right here is Lava and down here is Mistral. And just to show you, this is my work directory. So the CD in there ls cd upscale and i only have one directory it's a test directory because i want to show you all what the code looks like when i'm running it back up here python iterate o2 pi and let it go we should be seeing updates here so it's received the first image the id is one and you can see the resolution right here 1920 by 2889 this is not the resolution we want for the Stable Diffusion Excel dataset. After a little bit of time has elapsed, it has returned our description here, which is the verbose description. And now it was sent to the Mistral API down here, and it has given us back the properly formatted captions here. And it told us the best preset is 832 by 1216. All we have to do is let this run until it's finished. My final data set was just south of 500 images and this took me about five to six hours to run. Now let's just jump into the future and show you what it looks like when it's done. So the code has finished iterating over the sample upscale directory I provided and you can see the logs here, not making anything up. Everything's working as expected. Now let's go ahead and check out the images and captions. Here we are in the good old Budu dataset tag manager. And let's check out the captions. Young woman with red hair, black shirt holding hand on face, white background, black sweater around shoulders, two people visible. That's not true. And now we have this one, red bikini top, sitting on wicker chair, surrounded by potted plants. Yes, but not two. Blonde hair, white shirt, posing for camera, hand on head, eh, hand on chin maybe more like it. Eyes open looking off camera in room with white background, sure. White bikini, mm, it's a one piece swimsuit, poses for the camera with their hands on her head, sure. Appears to be enjoying herself, rocks are visible in the background. 
no mention of grass. Let's see, young woman with long hair, white shirt, black sweater, and there's no black sweater. Eyes are wide open. Giving off an inviting and friendly vibe. Posing. Let's go to some of the environment images now. Large, beautiful cathedral, with dome-shaped roof and cross on top, sure. Situated near water, yes. River, lake, sure. Boats docked nearby, yes. At least five boats in the scene, sure. Some closer to shore while further away, I guess. Impressive and picturesque setting, I guess. Next up is the interior of a subway train. Train station, it's not a train station, so this is a fail. Next up, large old castle overlooking water. I don't think that's true. Clock tower, nope. Moat, no. So you can see that in some cases, like this one, woman with blonde hair, yes. Long black coat, yes. White wig, maybe. Looking directly at camera, maybe. Giving off a tense vibe, dressed in medieval attire, sure. And then lastly, this one. Long dark hair, wearing a black and white outfit, looking directly at it. At, at what? Her makeup includes red lipstick. Background of the photo is blurred. Sure, sure, sure. So you can see that in some cases it's good. In some cases, it's completely off. It's really up to you how much faith you want to put in this, but you can see that this drastically cuts down on the time that you have to spend creating captions manually by hand. So I'm going to go ahead and run this for all of my dataset images now. So you followed along with the pipeline I've demonstrated throughout this video, and you might be wondering, what does your final dataset look like? Well, here it is. I did make some light manual tweaks to the captions for a bit more accuracy, but it was way quicker than having to tag everything from scratch. The efficiency gain here cannot be overstated. About 70% of the dataset is figures, and the remaining 30% are architecture, props, and various environments. There you have it. I finished running all of my upscaled images through the pipeline I showed throughout this video. I've also trained the Fine Tune and LoRa models already, and I'll go over them soon. If you want more in-depth information regarding SDXL training, you can watch my video about it. It's Kasukas number 18. Anyway, here we are in RunPod, and I just wanted to show what my setup was for this new training session. The template I'm using is this Stable Diffusion Web UI 3.3.2 by Ashley KZA or Ashley Kazal. If you go to the Bmulte GUI, it's the recommended RunPod template right here. If you click on this, it'll open that up. And here you are. If you don't understand some things, make sure you read the readme here. It will clear up all of your issues. In the documentation here, it tells you at which port all your visual interfaces are at. For the Bmulte GUI, it's at port 3010. Also, if you want to use JupyterLab, make sure to copy the password for that here. Anyway, go ahead and click on the start button here. As you can see, I'm using a rather expensive GPU here. Notably, an H100 80GB SXM5. It costs $4.69 per hour, which is a bit pricey. However, it fine tunes within 4 hours and also trains Allura with the Prodigy Optimizer in about 8 hours. In my opinion, it's money well spent. Now, what did all of our hard work culminate in? I ran some experiments on the fine tune, and here are the results. Starting with the fine tune, this is what it looks like. There is no second stage refinement on any of these. In my opinion, the fine tune didn't seem that great. I was kind of discouraged because if the result was poor, I wouldn't make this video at all and just delete the recordings. However, I didn't want to give up, so I went ahead and trained a LoRa using the Prodigy Optimizer. Those results are here. I ran three experiments for these with the same prompt and different seeds. This is the first seed, so it's baking in, and here we go, locking in. Surprisingly good in my humble opinion. Next up is the second seed results. These aren't cherry pick seeds or anything. And keep going. Also fine or great, depending on 
your eye, I would say is acceptable. Lastly, the third seed. And here we go. Once again, I'm kind of impressed. I was half expecting the caption quality to not be of a reasonable standard, but I don't know now. The results do speak for themselves. You've all seen the train models and their corresponding output images. However, how will these models fare in general use? Turning a stylized fictional character into a realistic one would be a strong proof of the trained realistic model's effectiveness. With that being said, here is a Comfy UI node workflow utilizing the Comfy UI IP Adapter Plus plugin developed by Cubic. It has a lot of features that appeal to me, and the repository is also very well documented. Cubic also has several videos showing how to use this plugin, and the most recent one covers this attention masking down here. It's very similar to multi-scale region. If that's the functionality you're used to with Stable Diffusion 1.5 and are missing in SDXL, be sure to check out that video. So we can click on this one to go to that video and go to his channel, Latent Vision, and this is his latest one attention masking. My workflow here is a modified version of his SDXL workflow. I've added in my realistic Laura in here and load Laura so you can see Costco Realistic Prodigy 01 and change the model here for Clip Vision to Stable Diffusion 1.5. In Cubic sample workflow for SDXL, I think he made a mistake and selected the wrong model in this node, but I'm not sure. It didn't work with his default settings, so I had to change that. Everything looks good here, and let's go ahead and generate. The generation has completed, and we turn this fictional character from Hong Kai Star Rail, Jing Liu, into a real human being, like so. Geppetto would be proud. Using the same technique, I created the thumbnail for this video. The input here this time is an image I made using my STXL fine-tuned style model from Casacast number 18. The base output image on the right here is pretty realistic in my opinion with the real world slight overexposure. I also used some masquerade nodes down here for inpainting the face and hands at a higher resolution. Pretty simple and nothing fancy going on here. That concludes my initial adventure with Autogen, AI agents, and local large language models. All in all, I saw the potential of how tedious tasks such as gathering and captioning a dataset could be automated. The first pass seemed promising, but I could see a few places where the process or technology could be improved. First of all, I didn't take full advantage of the power of AI agents in the first section. The reason being is that billing does seem pretty expensive, so it's probably not feasible unless you are funded at the industry level. Eventually, the hope would be to do everything locally and not rely on OpenAI's API, which is what Meta and Google seem to be pushing for with Llama and Palm, respectively. Second of all, the multimodal models with chat and vision are still in their nascent states. As the technology improves further, the description of the images should become more accurate. Eventually, they can also probably be properly fine-tuned. Lastly, when distilling the verbose description into the dataset captions, the resulting tags were out of order. As such, there is probably an improvement that can be made with QLaura. The Laura would be trained on the prompt instruction such as, please rearrange this description in this way, and the corresponding output would be what the correct captions should look like. I think this is possible, but I haven't tried due to the breadth and depth of this personal project. To finish up, let's thank the patrons from Patreon. This video was a bit different from the usual content, but I hope it was informative on some level. Please check all the links in the description for all the resources. Thanks again, and see you guys next time. Bye.